Following the Civil War, DuPont found itself under public scrutiny. The company had thrived during the war, producing an average of a million pounds of powder a year. Now, critics saw the rising fortune of the DuPonts as being a direct result of the deaths of thousands of soldiers. For the first time, they were branded with the label Merchants of Death. As the United States took the first difficult steps of reconstruction, Lamont DuPont stepped up his attempts to reconstruct the nature of his family's business. DuPont powder had been ideal for the guns and artillery of the Civil War, but it was woefully inadequate for the large blasting needs that now faced the country. In 1869, the Golden Spike was hammered at Promontory Point, Utah, completing the first transcontinental railroad and opening the floodgates of Western expansion. Lamont knew that pioneers, miners, and railroads would need explosives far more powerful than black powder to tame the mighty Rocky Mountains. He knew they needed nitroglycerin. For years, scientists and inventors had tried to harness the awesome power of the highly explosive nitroglycerin. For many, the attempts were fatal. Unlike gunpowder, which needs a spark or heat to detonate, nitroglycerin can explode at the slightest touch. In 1863, Swedish chemist Alfred Nobel designed a process that soaked the explosive liquid into inert clay, allowing it to be packaged and transported in sticks. The invention was named dynamite. And in the eyes of Lamotte, it was the future of the DuPont dynasty. He uh, desperately tried to get Henry uh, to switch from manufacturing black powder uh, to manufacturing uh, dynamite. Henry does everything he can really to uh, to stay a black powder company. Uh, he loves that business. It's a business he thoroughly understands. It's something that he is comfortable with and would really rather not see changed if at all possible. While Lamotte saw dynamite as the key to DuPont remaining on top of the industry, Henry had another plan for beating his competitors. What they decided to do was um, gobble up these other companies. They created a monopoly on gunpowder. Now, they called it the Gunpowder Trade Association, but it was really a gunpowder trust um, in the sense that they were controlling the market of gunpowder in the period after the Civil War. But while Henry could control the entire powder industry, he couldn't control his nephew, Lamotte. Frustrated by his uncle's unwillingness to adapt to the future, Lamotte quit the company and in 1880 opened his own dynamite factory, Rapano Chemical Company, just across the Delaware River in New Jersey. In building Rapano, Lamotte stressed safety just as his grandfather Irene had done when building the family's gunpowder mills 80 years before. At the plant, the nitroglycerin was manufactured in a house surrounded by wooden cribbed earth barricades. Inside, an operator constantly eyed the thermometer. If the chemical reaction was not precisely controlled, too much heat could be released, and an explosion of dire proportions would be inevitable. Cautiously, the nitroglycerin was run off, washed, and led to storage. An exact quantity of the lethal liquid was then taken to the dynamite mixing house in a specially designed, rubber-lined, rubber-tired cart. In the house, workers mixed specific amounts of dry ingredient and nitroglycerin, which were then thoroughly kneaded by revolving rubber wheels. Lamotte was right on all accounts. Dynamite was the future of the explosives industry, and his factory was an unqualified success. He could hardly keep up with the orders and almost instantly had to buy land for expansion. He skillfully bought out competitors, such as the California Powder Company, and soon dominated the market. But Lamotte's success was short-lived. On a Saturday morning in March of 1884, Lamotte was meeting with a salesman 
when one of his workers rushed into his office to tell him that there was a problem in the mix house. Lamont ran to the mix house with another fella and saw that, uh, that there was a catalytic reaction going on, but uh, Lamont attempted to solve that problem, but it was too late. And in the process, the whole works blew up. And he and, and uh, three other men were killed instantly. He was bright. Uh, he was a, a gifted chemist, a gifted manager, um, a real uh, entrepreneur, understood what it took to build a whole new industry. The saddest day in the history of the DuPont family was the funeral of Lamont. In dying, Lamont achieved what had eluded him in life. Rapano was purchased by DuPont. The family company was now in the dynamite business, a development that would bring the DuPont dynasty untold wealth. Five years after Lamont's untimely death, the DuPonts buried another family leader. In 1889, after reigning over the DuPont family and company for decades, the notoriously stubborn General Henry DuPont died. His office was still arranged identically to how it had been when he had taken it over 40 years earlier. Although he had turned the company into a thriving success, his one great failure was that his autocratic style had left no one prepared to lead the company into the next century. When he died, one of his nephews took over the company as senior partner, but um, there was not a dynamic leader waiting in the wings. After Henry's death, DuPont remained incredibly profitable, but lacked direction and leadership. The family's passion for the powder mills was mostly gone. On February 14, 1902, as the company approached its centennial, the board of directors decided to sell out to their rivals, Laughlin and Rand. But on the eve of the sale, as the board gathered for a final vote on the proposal, a lone dissenter stepped forward. The proposal to sell out to Ponta Laughlin and Rand did not happen because one of the board of directors, a relatively young man by the name of Alfred I. DuPont, really had very strong feelings for the brandy wine the old DuPont powder mills. He saw this as his birthright. Alfred had come to the meeting straight from the powder room, still covered in soot and dust. Alfred Irene DuPont stood up and said, I'll buy the business. So Alfred Irene immediately contacts his cousins, Thomas Coleman and Pierre Samuel, each of whom has an area of expertise that complements his own, and says, why don't we form a partnership and uh, buy the company for ourselves to run and continue to keep it in the family? Both cousins immediately jumped on board. The DuPont Corporation was what we would now call a, a holding operating company. That is, it owned stock in the actual company uh, that manufactured the munitions on the banks of the Brandywine River. And it also held uh, stock in other corporations that were suppliers to and or distributors of uh, the products that were necessary uh, for the manufacture of uh, munitions and the sale of the munitions themselves. Late one night, Alfred snuck into the office to review the company's books. Dust-covered pages not open since the days of the general were filled with assets. In his quick estimating, the company was worth at least twice the asking price of $12 million. The trio offered an audacious plan to finance the purchase. Rather than give the partners cash, T. Coleman instead convinced them to accept in its place one quarter of the stock in the new company. He promised that their annual dividends would exceed their current salaries. That was the mother of leveraged buyouts, using, as Pierre would say, using the, the owners, the seller's money to buy the new plant, or the new company. Almost 100 years to the day after their great-grandfather, Irene, had purchased the land on the Brandywine, 
the three cousins took over the company. The only money they spent on the deal was $700 each for the incorporating fees. There was a sense of relief that the business was going to stay in the family. Uh, I think there was also a sense of skepticism uh, that these three young guys could make this go. What Coleman, Pierre, and Alfred understood was that the company needed to be less a family partnership and more a corporation, a diversified corporation with department heads in charge of running the company. What Andrew Carnegie had done in steel, what John D. Rockefeller had done in oil, uh, they were going to do with dynamite. From the trio rose Pierre Samuel, or P.S. DuPont. The oldest son of Lamont, P.S. shared his father's pioneering spirit to reinvent the company, a skill that he was forced to use far earlier than he could have possibly imagined. When P.S. DuPont took control of the company, he soon found himself in quite a quandary. Theodore Roosevelt had assumed the presidency and was waving his fists at all the big monopolies in the United States, most particularly the Standard Oil Company. And they made Standard Oil break up, and the same was going to happen to DuPont. They'd be forced to diversify. Pierre led the company to diversify by using their expertise in the chemistry of explosives to expand into new product lines using similar chemistry it becomes possible for the company to begin to look at uh, lacquers, for example, or um, early man-made fibers uh, such as rayon. Despite DuPont's diversification, it was the munitions business that stood front and center when gigantic orders started coming in for the war to end all wars. DuPont just made a tremendous amount of money. The scale uh, of the operations in the munitions business in World War I, I think, was really unprecedented. So that it emerges as one of the major factors in uh, contributing to the fortunes of the DuPont uh, family and the DuPont uh, uh, business enterprise. During World War I, as DuPont grew to enormous size, Pierre and his associates began to think how can we maintain this large enterprise? How can we continue to employ these tens of thousands of people once the war is over? P.S. DuPont had become one of the richest men in America. Just before the outbreak of the war, he and a small group of DuPont executives had bought out T. Colbin's stock for $8 million. Within six months, Allied munition orders had pushed its value above 30 million. Pierre's wealth was best exemplified by his country home, Longwood. On Longwood's thousand acres, DuPont tried to recreate the grandeur and beauty of the most palatial villas and gardens he had seen during his world travels. In 1919, following the war, Pierre Samuel relinquished the chairmanship of DuPont to take charge of a fledgling company in which he had purchased a controlling interest. That company was General Motors. But DuPont had even higher aspirations. 